It used to be that if you wanted to get into desktop publishing, the first thing you had to do was to find your local Apple dealer. Well, nowadays, desktop publishing is moving full steam ahead into the world of MS-DOS. Today, we'll take a look at desktop publishing in the land of IBM and the compatibles on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, in this computer industry of ours, we know something is really serious when it gets its own magazine. And lo and behold, what do we have now but a magazine called PC Publishing, the desktop publishing resource for the IBM PC user. Of course, we've thought about desktop publishing the last couple of years as really being the exclusive domain of Apple and the Macintosh. Is it too late for the IBM guys to get into this? <laughs> I don't think so. This is a relatively new industry still. You load up an IBM PC with an EGA card, and it gives you real good graphics. Uh, there are applications now coming out desktop applications coming out for both Digital Research Gem and also Microsoft Windows, so I think the market's wide open. Today we're going to take a look at the IBM world and desktop publishing. We'll take a look at two new software packages that let you do DTP on your IBM PC or compatible. We'll see the newest version of Hewlett Packard's laser printer, and we'll see an optical scanner that lets you enter photographs directly into your desktop publishing document. Now, DTP has really revolutionized the whole printing and publishing business, and we're going to start out by taking a look at one high-end printing and publishing company to find out how it is adapting to the onslaught of desktop publishing. The immense popularity of desktop publishing is a worrisome development for commercial printers who see it as a potentially grave threat. The time and cost saved by in-house printing of reports, training manuals, advertising brochures, or any other document is seductively appealing to organizations with large printing budgets. Some commercial printers, heavily computerized themselves, are striking back in novel ways. At George Lithograph in San Francisco, the approach is to provide customers with an alternative to in-house publishing by bridging the electronic gap between desktop computer and professional printer. George provides its clients with a software hardware package called Automated Typesetting Process, or ATP+. The client works through a standard, high-level word processor to compose text. A soft-touch keypad for typesetting commands is the only additional piece of hardware. The keypad allows the user to enter coded commands without producing visible codes in the document, making it easier to read. The client can then send completed documents by telephone or mail to the printer, where the text is prepared for typesetting and graphics are added. Often forgotten in the heavily electronic world of desktop publishing are the manual and mechanical aspects of printing, the specialized talents that create the artwork and the design of a document, and the massive machinery that prints the final product. Modern commercial printers like George are hoping that their traditional customers will balk at making the investment in hardware and training that is required for in-house publishing. Instead, printers are adapting to the trend by integrating their systems with the new technology. Joining us now in the studio is Paul Brainerd, the president of Aldous Corporation, and sitting next to Paul, Roger Archibald, product marketing manager for Hewlett Packard's printer division. Gary? Paul, if I go out and buy a desktop publishing package, what can I do with it? What it allows you to do is use your personal computer to integrate text and graphics and put it together on a page and print it out 
on a laser printer mm -hmm. and get a high quality result that then can be reproduced on an office copy machine or at your local print shop. Okay, so it sort of takes the place of mechanical typesetting? Yes, it does. Now, what uh, kind of customers do you find? Who are you selling this to? Very broad. There's mm -hmm. over 30,000 users of PageMaker in the first year, and we find it to be corporations, individuals, artists. Um, a very broad segment of, of business and nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. How about showing us page, PageMaker? Sure. What I have here is the PC version of PageMaker, and we're going to create a small publication. Mm -hmm. One of the first things you'll notice is that we're using a graphics environment or a graphics user interface, in this case, Microsoft Windows, which allows us to have pull down menus and make it easy to learn and use. I'm going to create a new publication and it's going to come up with a dialogue, what we call a dialogue, asking me how many pages I'd like and what paper size. I'm going to create a 16-page newsletter, click on OK, and the computer will go off and create my publication and then present me with a blank page. One of the things that I can easily do and one of the things I want to first change is my type specifications for my publication. In this case, I'd like my type to be Times Roman and I have this set up for the HP LaserJet, so I'm going to select a 10-point type style in Times Roman. Now I'm going to switch to pages two and three. I'll come, we'll forget about page one right okay. at the moment. I'm not sure what I want to do with it. I'm going to put some column guides up on the page. It's going to ask me how many columns. I can have up to 20 columns on the page. I'm going to put two columns on my publication. Now I'm ready to bring in the text and graphics. The key command in PageMaker is place, and it means place text and graphics mm -hmm. files. And it's going to give me a list of the various image files, graphics such as WordStar, Moldimate, Microsoft Word. And what I'm going to do is come down here and select a scanned image that I've done with a scanner, something we're going to talk about later in the show. And I get a little icon here of a paintbrush and it's asking me, where do I want to put my scanned image on the page? I'm going to put it in the upper left-hand corner, click the mouse button, and it reads the scanned image on the page. Now let's go to place again and I'm going to place some text. In this case, it's a file that I created with Multimate, a word processor um, for the PC that, that many corporate clients use. And I'm going to take a file called tips document, and it'll read it into the memory of the computer, and then we're going to place it into the columns that I've set up on the page. My cursor changes into an icon, in this case, a text block, indicating we're going to place text. I click the mouse button, it reads the text file and composes it to fit within the columns. And if this was justified text, it would actually hyphenate the text mm -hmm. for me. We're going to flow it into that column. I have a little more text, so I'm going to click on the plus at the bottom of the first column and then bring it over into the second column. Now, we're working in a reduced size on a double spread here. Uh, I'm going to zoom up on the page. We can work in any of five different sizes, but I'm going to zoom up to actual size on the page. And now we can actually read the text, uh, look at the graphic, um, and edit the text if we want oh, to. If you were to edit the text, do you add anything to it? Can you cause it to flow automatically throughout the whole yes, document? Yes, it'll okay. flow through the columns. Now, um, this question about the, uh, how important has a laser printer been, Roger, in the whole advent of uh, desktop publishing? Well, the laser printer was really one of the key hardware elements that started desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. Finally, it put in the hands of the PC user the ability to create high quality output uh, local to their PC. Can you have some examples? Sir? Yes. Uh, it sh this shows some of the capabilities of being able to use multiple fonts and different type styles on a page, which mm -hmm. the laser printer has the capabilities to do. Also, the ability to create electronic forms and then merge the data in with those forms. And then lastly, some of the output that would come from a page composition system mm -hmm. like PageMaker is mixed text and graphics on a single page showing a variety of font styles. And uh, no, Paul, you have some examples of the complete documents here also. Yes. Yeah. And the newsletter that I was producing on the page, this is a customer's newsletter for a higher education consortium in Missouri. Um, here is a data sheet from Harris Semiconductors where they're producing their data sheets with PageMaker. Again, the integration of the text and graphics. This is interesting in that it represents some of the nonprofit uses. This is a short fiction quarterly that's produced back in Massachusetts. And personally, I, I get a lot of gratification from seeing these types of documents. Well, you demonstrated PageMaker on an HP Vector, which is yes. an AT compatible. Do you need an AT to run PageMaker? We would recommend it because PageMaker is an example of an application that's really pushing the boundaries of what microcomputers can do today in terms of text and graphics. But you could use an XT computer. Uh, and particularly with an enhancement to it to increase the speed. 
Roger, briefly, you have to explain DDL, the document description language that HP has chosen to use, and why you picked that over PostScript or other possibilities. Yes, we took and studied for two years page description language and, and looked at the three major leaders in that area. We adopted DDL primarily because it complemented the HP business segment that we were after. People working on larger documents, networked environments, and it complemented the current HP printer command language that is in LaserJet right now. Briefly, one other question. I know both you guys' companies, HP and Aldis, has gotten together with Microsoft now on some kind of uh, alliance. Tell me about that. Well, that alliance is primarily targeted in, in marketing and promotion activities. The three companies have found that in promoting uh, desktop publishing together, that Microsoft with the Windows environment, Aldis with PageMaker as a page composition system, and then the Hewlett Packard LaserJet and Vectra PC were able to go out and promote that to help uh, the desktop publishing in the MS DOS Get environment. Get it going in the MS DOS world. Provide a solution for our customers. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Now, one of the page description languages we heard about was PostScript. That was developed by a company called Adobe Systems, a company which has really grown up on the heels of the desktop publishing revolution. Wendy Woods has a profile of Adobe. The American entrepreneur's dream is to have the right product at the right time with all the right customers lined up. Well, that's exactly what happened here at Adobe Systems in January of 1985 when Apple unveiled its laser writer printer. Adobe Systems of Palo Alto, California wrote PostScript, the language which the laser printer understands and uses to print out documents. By virtue of being out there first, PostScript promises to become the industry standard. I think it has a good chance of becoming one. Uh, clearly, there are a number of competing uh, languages out there that are, trying to, that are trying to catch up with us. And I, th I think the right word is catch up. But we have a good, solid lead. And I think over the years, over the next year, our lead will become stronger. After Apple employed PostScript in its laser writer, other companies followed. DEC, Wang, Texas Instruments, and Data Products, to name a few. Adobe's success is measured in its growth, from two people in 1982 to over 80 today, from zero income to $12 million a year. PostScript is the page description language in over 50,000 installed laser printers, and without these laser printers, there would be no desktop publishing revolution. We know that we've had a fairly fundamental impact on the way that people do publishing and printing and, and that as the years go on that impact is really growing. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us now is Richard Amon, president of Dest Corporation, and sitting next to Rich is John Meyer, the president of Ventura Software. Stuart, I might mention that uh, John was one of the major contributors to the GEM project when he was working at Digital Research. You're clearly a good guy, then. Yeah. Along with <laughs> Don High School and Lee Lorenzo. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, John, how do you differentiate uh, Ventura Software, uh, Ventura Publisher, from the uh, other products such as PageMaker? There are really three separate uh, different distinctions. Number one is the speed. We have the speed to run on a standard unmodified XT and, of course, run very nicely on an AT. Second of all is we have concepts that are built in that allows a non-typesetter to get typographically correct results, even if they don't know a point from a pica, two mm -hmm. typographic terms. And third of all is we have the ability to do long documents, such as technical manuals, as well as shorter documents like newsletters and brochures. Okay, now one of the important things in composing a document is getting the pictures and drawings in there, right? So, so uh, Richard, you have a, an example of, of a scanner here that uh, takes various documents and so forth and reads them into a PC, is that correct? That's correct, Gary. Um, our company specializes in input, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, desktop publishers as well as to word processors. So let me just show you an example here of how we go about scanning information. I've got a, a screen that is a desk screen where I can select uh, text scanning option. Mm -hmm. um, now I've done that and what I'm going to do is to actually insert the page of printed information into the scanner. Now, Rich, just to clarify, but where there is a computer under the table here. Yes, is it there is. Compact 286, which we're, <laughs> we're operating this we, behind the, the audience table. can't see that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, in this case, Richard, you're actually going to be re you're reading in the, the words as they're a typewritten, and they're going to convert them internally into ASCII form. We're really replacing the function of uh, somebody sitting in front of a keyboard. Okay. So the scanner is recognizing material on a page, and it's converting it into, as you say, ASCII mode. Okay, do you have any kind of a, a, a measurement of how the data rates, how fast you can, how many words you can read, and so forth? Well, this is about. 
20 times faster than the fastest typist could okay. enter the information. That took us about 15 seconds to scan that page of information. You see it here appear on the screen. Now, can you, can you handle any kind of type fonts, a, a typewritten page, or say a Gothic or something like that, Roman well, Gothic? <laughs> um, our scanners are programmed to read the 16 most common type okay. styles that are encountered in the office, and this includes quite a wide variety of different type fonts. Okay, now, do, you have, do you find any errors in the translation process that you have to correct manually? Well, of course, that depends on the quality of the document oh, that's put okay. into the scanner. Right. Um, if it's smudged or if there's uh, wrinkles on the document, it may have some difficulty. Okay. Um, but about, the quality, about, uh, as you see here, is quite good. How about just pictures, when you're trying to read a picture and to move, move that into your document? Okay, you? this is a, another part that okay. we can demonstrate for you. What I'm going to do now is to instruct the uh, scanner to scan an image. Um, now, there's a screen that appears here that gives me some selection as to how I go about scanning this image. I'm actually going to scan a photograph. I'm going to scan just part of a page of information. And I'm going to indicate to the software that this is um, actually what I want to do. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the part of the page that I want to scan. And you see I've darkened a portion of the page that I want to scan. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to go, and I just hit the OK button. Now what I'll do is insert this photograph into the scanner. Um, this photo happens to be um, one of our key employees in our company. Okay. We'll, we'll <laughs> right. see him appear on the screen. Here. The employee of the month. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And does it take longer for it to scan the photo than it does? Well, actually, it's faster because there's less software like involved in, uh, in translating this image into uh, actually halftone information. We'll see it appear on the hmm. screen now. And you see the quality of this is quite right. good. Good news. Now, these, oh, I'm these, sorry. Um, both the text information and the image information uh, can be stored in the file to be picked up by desktop publishing software okay. such as John's. Yeah, if we can ask you, Rich, to do that and kind of get out of your program sure. and get us ready for John and Ventura. And if I can ask you while he's sure. doing that, John, using something like Ventura on an IBM PC or compatible mm -hmm. system, do you have the same capabilities as using something else in the Mac environment, which most people are used to? Yeah, the capabilities are certainly almost identical. There's really no difference as to what computer it runs on. The important thing is the kind of software that you purchased, whether it's for the Macintosh or for the PC. And as I mentioned before, we've tried to develop something that's really for the general user out there rather than the specialist and allows them to do things such as technical manuals as well as the brochures and newsletters. John, as this uh, program's coming up and getting ready to run here, how, what effect is this going to have on manual typesetting in our world here? Well, it's interesting. Uh, as always, there are those that think it's going to put an old technology out of business mm -hmm. and some that think it's going to enhance it. I happen to believe that uh, manual typesetting is going to be enhanced by this and that the smart operators out there will include desktop publishing as part of their typesetting offerings so that someone that has composed a document at their desk themselves and now wants to have it printed not just on a laser printer, such as the ones we were talking about earlier in the show, but also on a typesetter, they'll have that option as well. John, you've got a piece of paper in front of you. Is that the result of Ventura output there? Can you yes, this that? is the result of the output. And as you can see here, we have a document that, in fact, uh, was done on a laser printer, such as the one that we saw earlier. And I'll show you just uh, here in a moment what it looks like up on the screen. Well, you're loaded now. Could you run Ventura? Sure can. Uh, if I go down to the first page, let me just point out that I have text that's already been loaded into the document here. And if I pull down the menu here, you'll see that we have a variety of different options for text where we can bring that text in from. WordStar, Multimate, Microsoft Word, Xerox Writer, all the standard types of word processors. Once we have the text in there, this is where I allow someone who is not a typesetter to get typeset results. I can make that, for instance, a heading just by pointing to the paragraph and saying, make that a heading. I can make that a subheading just by pointing to that paragraph and say, make it a subhead, and so on. And so I don't have to know anything about points, pikas, and uh, anything else. If I go down to the next page, here's what this document looks like after it's all been tagged and I've brought a picture in. And just to show what it's like to bring a picture in, uh, such as the one that Rich was just uh, scanning. Let me add what we call a frame to the, the, uh, the box, or to the page, rather. And notice how the text just automatically flows around that frame. I move it anywhere on the page. Text re-hyphenates, re-justifies around the edge of the page. And I could put now a picture of the space shuttle from the AutoCAD uh, package mm -hmm. into that frame. And as I make the frame larger and smaller, the shuttle gets larger and smaller. And as you'll see here, we now have a bigger picture of the shuttle. Mm -hmm. Moving on to show some of the other examples, Here's a finished page out of a technical manual. Here are a table of contents and an index because we automatically generate table of contents, indices, we automatically section number, footnote, and so on. 
Here's a page out of a book, and it turns out that you'll see in just a moment the picture which uh, Richard scanned in earlier appear down here in the right-hand corner. <laughs> right. And I can even move it around. I can move his face That's around great. within there. And we get a little animation here on the screen. Okay. Or I can move it someplace else on the page. Gentlemen, we're out of Perhaps. time. Thank you very much. Thank in you. just a minute, we're going to meet one of the chief gurus of the desktop publishing field and take a look into the future of desktop publishing in the world of MS-DOS. Stay with us. Joining us now in the studio is Jonathan Siebold, Editor-in-Chief of the Siebold Report on Desktop Publishing. And next to Jonathan, our regular guru on any subject, George Morrow. Jonathan, uh, in all these desktop publishing packages we've seen so far, uh, they basically uh, use text from other word processors, common word processors that are used uh, today. Is it, are they going to actually evolve into this? Uh, is this going to become the word processing phenomenon? In other words, all those little character-based word processors kind of go away? There are a lot of people who think that, and I, I think that that that's probably what's going to happen in the long run. I think that what you will see is a continuum of product uh, that covers a whole range of needs from doing simple memos to doing very complex documents. And I think that eventually we'll evolve into products which are very complete products, which are text and graphic products. So maybe in so someday we'll have one of these things in our, in our home and you can write a letter to grandma and, and have a picture of the kids. Yeah. Right? <laughs> sure, sure. And I think, I think that, that um, that's, that's at, at the base of what this whole revolution is about. What we're doing basically is we're taking something that was a specialized skill, required specialized equipment, specialized trained people, and we're programming that, we're putting into a computer so everybody can use it. Mm -hmm. So that no longer do you have these specialists standing between you and what you want to communicate, you do it directly mm -hmm. yourself. And mm -hmm. people become more computer literate. That's right. Jonathan, why did it take so long to get desktop publishing in the MS-DOS environment? What was the difference between that and the Mac situation? Well, the Mac environment was, was really made for this sort of application. And that goes back way before the Mac, because the Mac environment owes its, owes its foundation to work that was done at Xerox PARC mm -hmm. back in the early 1970s. And they were doing desktop publishing yeah. at Xerox PARC on this sort That's of right. application. Mm -hmm. What we're doing now is we're turning the MS-DOS machines into that kind of machine, into a Macintosh or into a Xerox type of machine because that's the natural sort of environment for this sort of application. George, was this a hardware or software led? Did it, did it take the laser printer to get all this, this new industry I, going? I think so. I think it's hardware that inspires software. And then software comes along and drags that hardware down the learning curve and into the marketplace. It happened with the Apple. The Apple, I think, inspired the spreadsheet. And then the spreadsheet began wagging the dog. The tail started wagging the dog because spreadsheet uh, sales, people went out to buy Macintoshes and Apples just to get spreadsheets. It, it is an inspirational thing and then it turns around and it, and it starts being soft. So in this case it's really a combination of high resolution graphics and laser printers, right? I think it's laser yeah. printers. I don't know that the high resolution, yeah. I don't really consider the Mac very high resolution graphics, but I think it's the laser printer. And there, you know, it was the small uh, consumer mm -hmm. copier, I think, that drove that, mm -hmm. the business of the a removable cartridge, that sort of thing made it possible to do a low-cost laser printer, which then inspired all of the software. About 30 and seconds gonna... left, Jonathan. You want to get something <laughs> in. Sorry, George. I was going to say that, yes, I think, I think George is right in this. In fact, historically, what really happened here was um, I saw the laser writer about nine months before it was introduced and said, this is going to turn the whole world yeah. upside down. Uh, went to Paul Brainerd and said, this is what you ought to be working on and got him together with Apple. And well, and now from. it's folded itself into these scanners. Right. Yeah. And right. it really is revolutionary, as you have oh, said. Yeah. Gentlemen, right. we're out of time. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's Computer News. Random access file this week, one major company is getting out of personal computers while another one is introducing its first model. AT&T announced that it's phasing out production and development of personal computers. AT&T instead will work exclusively with Olivetti, which is a major supplier of computers in Europe. AT&T already has a deal with Olivetti, which makes the AT&T PC6300. It appears AT&T will not renew its agreement with Convergent Technologies, which now makes the AT&T Unix PC. AT&T spokesman said the company will now concentrate on helping its customers use a variety of computers to interface with its network of telephone lines. 
Meanwhile, AST Research, makers of PC expansion boards and most well-known for its six-pack plus board, introduced its first computer, the Premium 286, an AT compatible. AST says its 286 machine can run at 10 megahertz and features a one megabyte fast RAM card. The Premium 286 is being targeted at the desktop publishing market. IBM PC clones are now moving out of the computer stores and into the mass merchandisers. The new Hyundai blue chip computer will soon be showing up in discount chains like Walmart, Federated Stores, and Toys R Us. The basic Hyundai PC clone sells for $699, though a complete system with monitor full memory and a second drive runs around $1,000. A grim prediction for the computer industry this week from International Data Corporation. They projected industry growth of under 10% annually for the rest of the decade and said the boom could return in the 1990s when new applications using artificial intelligence create new markets for personal computers. Another gloomy report this week came from a survey done at the University of Colorado. It reported that office automation is a flop and that most executives say computers have not increased productivity. Some conclusions from the study, documents written on word processors are 27% longer than those written on typewriters. And documents written on word processors take 34% longer to compose than those written in longhand. Time for this week's software review, and here's Paul Schindler. Ideas are hard to come by. Wouldn't it be nice if there were some way of generating good ideas? Well, now there is in the Idea Generator, a new decision support system. Now, decision support systems can be pretty tough to use because they don't really resemble any kind of manual system that users are familiar with. Well, Idea Generator overcomes that with a high degree of hand-holding. For example, it encourages you to think some more about your last unfinished project. It takes a nice tutorial approach to life. That's particularly useful in this kind of program, which you won't necessarily run every day. You can perform a quick review of what you've done so far. The program allows you to describe situations, goals, and indicate people involved in decisions. Idea Generator determines what steps you've looked at and which you need to complete. It's based on popular idea generating techniques. Experience and Software Incorporated of Berkeley, California presents the Idea Generator, priced at $200. But what's an idea worth? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Microsoft has come out with a new version of Word for the Macintosh, which allows you to move word processing files from the Mac to an IBM PC. Apple chairman John Scully praised the software as another leg up for the Mac in the business world. IBM has come out with a new computer laser disc package designed to provide adult literacy training. The package is called PALS, short for Principle of the Alphabet Literacy System. It uses video discs and synthesized speech to teach literacy to users who can't read. The system uses a combination of XTs and PC juniors and can teach 16 students at a time. Finally, somebody's at last trying to do something about the sorry state of software documentation. The publisher of a Cambridge-based software newsletter is suggesting annual awards for the best software documentation as a way to motivate software companies to improve their manuals. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to also give out a dog award for the worst documentation of the year. We'd all have some nominees for that category. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.